going on, folks? My name is Mike, and today I'm going to be talking about an important topic for C and C++ programmers. And specifically, this talk is going to be targeted at C++ programmers using pointers. Now, folks have often said that pointers are scary or something that they don't understand in C++. In this talk, I'm going to go through many examples and slides to show you what pointers are so you can hopefully understand them once and for all. Now, this talk was based off a talk that I gave at CPPCon in 2021. However, in the video that you're watching, you're going to be able to see an extended version of this talk, and I'll be able to dive into and run the code example shown in the slides. Otherwise, the CPPCon talk from 2021 has a lot of interesting discussion and questions from the audience members, so I'll link that whenever that is publicly released in the description. For now, enjoy this talk, and hopefully we'll just demystify pointers. Alrighty, folks, let's go ahead and get into it. So I'm going to start with the presentation and just let you know that the code from this video, as well as the official talk that I gave, is available on github.com. So feel free to peruse any of those examples or play around with them as needed. That said, most of the code is fully included on the slides, so you'll probably learn a lot by typing it out. So again, a little bit about who I am. If you want to know my uh, credentials, here they are. But let's go ahead and move on. So. You know, part of this idea or part of the power of programming with C++ has this idea of pointers. So if you're watching this talk, you're probably curious of learning about them. But truly, as a programmer, one of the really coolest moments was when I understood pointers. That is when I could write some code that looked like what's above here and really understand what it's doing on the first try. That is where I have these symbols here with the asterisks and the ampersand. I understand that creating the asterisk here next to the int is creating a pointer, and the ampersand and the x is in fact looking up the address of x. These are essentially a function call here. So the reality is, though, it wasn't until later in graduate school, or maybe even later, such as now when I've been teaching the topic, that I really understand the power of pointers. So in part of this talk, you're going to see me talk about pointers, but I actually think about pointers in a different way. I think about ownership and lifetime of variables, the levels of indirection, performance, readability, and overall memory safety when we're talking about pointers and things that hold addresses. So I'm going to try my best to show pointers in various use cases, as well as how to fix the potential problems that happen with pointers. So again, if you're watching this talk here and now, the advantage is I'm going to run through most of the examples I do in the slides so you can actually see the crashes take place. And we'll talk about the code snippets provided in this uh, presentation here. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll be very comfortable with modern C++, raw, plain, naked. There's a bunch of different names, but just raw, plain, or naked pointers. All right, and if you're an expert watching this talk, this talk might not be for you, but maybe you'll at least get something interested out of it at least thinking about how to teach beginners or maybe why we should still teach folks the underlying raw pointers. I will get to the end where we talk about something known as a smart pointer. So you'll have uh, some way to figure out how to introduce that subject or perhaps why to encourage beginners to use some of these newer modern C++ features. All right, so we got to start from the beginning here and just figure out what a pointer is. And a pointer is just a variable that stores a memory address of some object type. So I'm going to look at an example here uh, in this code. So here at line eight, I have int star. And these really go together here. This is the type here. So I like to put the asterisk right next to the type. And this says that we're declaring a pointer here. And I'm going to prefix my pointers in this presentation with a P just so you can keep clear that this is a pointer to some sort of integer. Again, we'll talk about this and emphasize this as we go on. The ampersand of x tells me that I'm retrieving the address of x here. So I could also rewrite this another way and I say ampersand with the parentheses of x, and this would be the exact same line here. But you could think of the ampersand as a function call. It's an operator in this context saying, retrieve the address of x, please. Why are we retrieving the address of x? Well, remember, a pointer is a variable that stores the memory address of a specific object type. In this case, a pointer here. And we'll see that int x equals 7, and we're retrieving the address of some integer, which we can point to here. OK, we'll go over this example several times so that it's clear exactly what's going on. And the equals assignment here 
is storing the address of x, remember, that's what we retrieved here, into our p of x here. So we're essentially copying that value into our integer here, and then we can thus say p of x points to x. Okay, and we will do an illustration of this as well. So if p of x is going to store the address of x, this allows us to store the value of x or access the value of x indirectly because we're pointing to the memory where x lives. Okay, so we're going to have to visualize memory in a moment for this to truly make sense for us, but this is the idea. Pointers allow us to indirectly access memory. And this can be very important because we could have multiple pointers, for example, pointing to a variable. That's one of the points of pointers to be able to share or update auto values at one time. OK, so if we print this out, it's clear that X is going to, in fact, print out seven. And what's this next line going to do here? Well, the star or the asterisk in front of PFX here is actually going to do something called dereferencing. So we're going to dereference p of x and retrieve the value of the thing that we point to, or the value at the address of where x is, which should retrieve us 7 here. And in fact, if we run this code from our code samples, this will be true. I'm going to go ahead and exit this presentation here and do a little dance here um, so you can see that, again, in the repository, you have all these samples if you do want to run the code here. So let's go ahead and look at initialize here just to see that this is the same code here. And let's go ahead and run this code here. Initialize dash O, the program name here. So this is the compiler that we used. I'm using C++17, even though this isn't using any modern features, I like to use a modern version of the language, the source file that we're compiling, and what we're going to output the binary as prog. And we'll run that, and again, we can confirm x is 7 here, and when we dereference p of x, we also retrieve the value 7 here. All right, let's go ahead and return to the presentation, and let's try to visualize this a little bit. And again, one of the parts that I think beginners struggle with is visualizing pointers and how they work. So one thing that you can always do when you have a program is to try to draw it out on a pen and paper. This sounds like it might be very boring or tedious or that you might have to draw a lot of things out, but you have to ask yourself, how can you really code something until you actually understand what you're coding? So drawing can be very useful. And with pointers, I found for beginners or even experts or anywhere in between, it's useful to draw the problem that you're trying to solve. Because once you can describe it, once you can draw it, then you can implement it in code. All right, so there was a little animation here. I am going to play that again, and I'll walk us through it. But let's go ahead and just visualize our program here. So again, it's useful to be able to draw this program on pen and paper. So what's going on step by step here? Well, the first thing that we're doing is realizing that x must have some address. So this is true of any variable that we have. It has to be stored somewhere, right? This variable here, x, is just, it's sort of a convenience for us as programmers if we really want to think about things at a deep level. x is a way for us as programmers to refer to just some address in memory. That happens to have the value 7 here, OK? So how we can visualize this is by just drawing a box here, representing a piece of memory and writing in a 7 here. And that lives at some address here. We don't care what it is for the purpose of this illustration, but it's probably something like 0x1001. Or if it's an integer, realistically, maybe it's uh, aligned to a 4-byte value or whatever, but uh, it is somewhere in memory. We don't care right now. The second part of this, <clears throat> and I'll remove myself, is that the pointer to an integer is no different. Right? P of x is just some way for us to name where some integer pointer lives. And you'll hear me call this integer pointer because it's an int with a star or a pointer to an integer. That's the same thing when referring to pointers here. But the same thing applies. I have some box here of memory where I'm going to store my value. And what am I storing? Well, it's the address of x here, which I'm uh, highlighting with my cursor and red towards the middle of your screen. So that should get the value 0x1001, which happens to be the address of where our 7 is. Okay, And this itself has its own memory address because, again, it's its own box where we're storing things. 
So again, trying to draw this out, even for a simple little program, this is a key way to start understanding pointers and how they work. So let me go ahead and show you a little animation here. And let's walk through this just one more time here. And let me go ahead and let this pause for a moment and play from the start. All right, so let's go ahead and, and see this from the start once it runs through. And I am trying to draw out each step logically one after the other. So the first thing when I just create int x here, that gives me storage somewhere saying, hey, give me room for one integer here. And then once I assign it, then I can fill in that box. That's what lives at that address and has an integer type. And then I do the same thing for my pointer, p of x. I draw the box here and it's got to have an address as well. And then once I assign it to, well, what am I doing? The retrieving the address of x. So I've got to follow this to the address of where x is. And I store that memory location there. So it's as simple as that. Feel free to watch this as many times as you like, but you have the full uh, animation there of what's going on. All right. So again, a big part of this is going to be to understand memory and to start thinking about programs in terms of memory and storage. So let's go ahead and try to visualize this concept of memory or this green stick of RAM, random access memory. This is called your DRAM or dynamically random access memory or sometimes working memory. OK, let's take a closer look at this. OK, so we can think about memory at many different levels. Chances are you know what a hard drive is, and that's where it stores all of your data. But you actually have this working memory, which is typically where all of your running programs are accessing, or at least we like it when they stay in this memory space. Talking about the full memory hierarchy and all the different types of memory is probably beyond the scope of this, but just know that you have many different types of memory. Now, this actually is very important if you want to think about things like performance, but we'll get to that again. Remember, this is a beginner's talk, and we want the experts to uh, perhaps watch another talk um, or for this to serve as a foundation for you when you become an expert later on in your programming career. All right, so for now, let's just focus on that we have some amount of memory. And usually it's in these sticks of RAM, and we call this our working memory. And we can just visualize memory as a linear set of addresses here. So here's the addresses in hex, and we just have one byte after the other. So you'll see incrementing one byte at a time here. And these are just random locations. They could be anywhere, but just notice that each of these boxes represents one byte of memory. So that's what this memory is. And depending on the data that we're trying to store, there's going to be different amounts of memory for each variable. So, for example, if I have an integer x that is equal to 7, that happens to take up on my system four of these boxes, four bytes to represent the integer 7. And it's not just the single integer 7, but the possibility that an integer could be any value between negative 2 billion something to 2 billion uh, whatever. Uh, so I need to be able to represent all those ranges of values with the integer type. That's why it takes up four boxes here. OK, so why exactly did it take up four boxes? Well, there's a way that we can check here. And in C++, we have some example here uh, and a handy operator known as size of here. So because I'm online here and I can actually uh, do some of these uh, experiments, I'm going to bring up CPP reference here and show you size of. And just so you can see the size of, again, it's an operator that queries the size of an object or the type. So, and again, it must be used when we actually want to know in bytes how big some data type is. So you can see some examples here. This is exactly the example that I have on the slide here. So I'll go ahead and bring it up. And if you want, you have access to the various samples so we can, uh, again, run this here. So in this example, I'm just checking the size of an integer to confirm or show you on my machine it's four. Now, again, depending on when you watch this video, you may have a different number. Most folks on a 64-bit system, which is most laptops and machines today, are going to get back a 4 today. So you can kind of count on that, but it's never a guarantee, so you should check with size of just to confirm. OK, so what about our pointer here? Because we figured out how to store x equals 7 in memory, but what about the pointer? Because again, that has its own box. We saw that in the visualization previously. So how does that get stored? Well, this actually takes up eight boxes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Again, why is this the case? Well, what I have here is, is a pointer to an integer. So let me back up perhaps for uh, one slide here. And since I need to be able to store any possible address on my system, and I have a 64-bit machine, it must be that I need 8 bytes. And if you aren't sure, let's go ahead and just query this so that we can test. Because again, we have the code. So how would you know here? Okay, so let's go ahead and check. I'm going to modify our size of example just for the purpose of this video. And let's go ahead and print the size of an int pointer here. Okay, so I'm just going to make this uh, an asterisk here. And to compile this, well, I'm going to use the following. And it's a good idea to include some of these other commands, like give all the warnings and all the extra warnings possible, just so we can be extra safe here. So I'll go ahead and run this, and we can clearly see the size of a pointer is 8. Now, sometimes you might have named symbols, for example, in your program. Here's what we've been using here. The of x equals the address of x. And I could actually just check the size of the actual type here. And that would, if I recompile it and rerun it, you'll get the same value. So either is fine if you want to put in just the variable name or the actual type name. Both would be uh, perfectly fine here. Okay, so we can confirm. Again, that's why we have uh, eight bytes for our pointer here. Okay, so what does this pointer actually do then? Well, again, it stores this address, so we have a way of indirectly accessing the value seven here. So that's pretty cool here that we can actually uh, see how this is working. Again, we're following the arrow. Since we're storing an address here, I need some way to get to 7 here. And let's go ahead and figure out how we get to that value 7 here. I have mentioned this term one time, and perhaps this is where folks get a little bit lost. It's in the terminology. So what I'm going to do here is figure out how do I dereference my pointer, that is, follow the arrow to the address of the thing I'm at and retrieve the value here, seven, from the thing that we point at. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at that and figure out what dereferencing means. So it means we're accessing the address stored in our pointer and we wanna access the value pointed to by our pointer. And this could mean that we are modifying the value or just reading the value. So it could be a read or a write operation. Let's go ahead and take a look here as we move forward to understand dereferencing. Okay, so for dereferencing a pointer, again, this is our way to retrieve a value that we are pointing to with our pointer type. So whatever here is at line eight and how we retrieve that value. Here it is in a plain sentence if it's helpful and you wanna pause the video and try to read and understand this. But syntactically, it's what I have here in the orange box. So anytime I put an asterisk in front of the pointer, that means I'm dereferencing it. So. I use the asterisk in two contexts here. One, when I'm declaring my pointer, and the second is when I am dereferencing. So that is when I'm trying to retrieve the value of the thing that I'm pointing at, or refer to it, if that helps you uh, sort of understand it. You're referred to it by sort of decrypting or analyzing or um, you know, breaking down the address. Again, if that's a helpful way for you to remember what uh, dereference uh, actually means. Okay, so again, on the two uses of the asterisk, the first is when you are declaring your type, and that's just part of C++. And it doesn't matter if you put the asterisk right next to the type like I have, or next to the variable name. Now for me, I think it's a little bit more intuitive for beginners to put it right next to the uh, data type so that you know it's an integer pointer and sort of reads out uh, nicely, but you could also have int space asterisk p of x that would also be an acceptable style and the second thing stylistically that i like to do is prefix my variables with a p or a p underscore so that i know that they're pointers different style guides will recommend otherwise but at least in this presentation it'll be clear what are pointers and what aren't and again the second use is when we dereference so that's just when the asterisk is in front of p of x here okay so let's go ahead and review or recap what we've seen so far. So just from a syntax point of view, because I know this is where a lot of beginners can struggle, here are the different 
things that we've learned about with syntax. We've learned about pointers, the ampersand to retrieve the address, and the two uses of the asterisk. So I'm going to actually run this example again uh, called dereference here just so we can see it. So I'll walk through it here and then I'll run it. So in this example, we have our x equals 7, assign a new pointer p of x to the address of x. This time I put parentheses around x just to make clear we can think of ampersand as an operator or a function call on x to retrieve the address. And when I print these out, I get the address of x here and what p of x is pointing to. Well, since p of x is storing the address of x and pointers just store addresses, these two values should indeed be the same here. And then if I just print the value of x here, I should have 7. That's what's in this box. And when I dereference p of x by putting the asterisk in front of it, I get, well, whatever lives at this address here, which happens to be, well, the address of x. So it makes sense that I would get 7 back. Okay, so let me go ahead and exit this and we'll run the dereference uh, example. Here's the code again, and let's just go ahead and compile it and run it here. So I'll go ahead and type this out, the reference.cpp-o prog, and then I'll run it here. Okay, so we can see that the results in this case match exactly what the slide is showing. And again, a tip that I like to tell folks is that you can, in fact, just print out these values. It's a great way to test your assumption. Now, if you've seen some of my other lessons on GDB debugging, you can use your interactive debugger to print out the addresses or dereference so you don't have to litter your program with these C out statements. So I would recommend uh, checking out some of my videos on that. Otherwise, you know, this is perfectly fine when you're learning how to use pointers. Print stuff out, see if it tests your uh, assumption of what you think the value will be, and see if it matches, again, your drawing of what you have on paper. All right, let's go ahead and resume the slideshow here. Okay, so here's a little test for you here. So what I've got in this code, and I actually want you to think about it and read this code here before you proceed. So what happens if I dereference p of x and then change the value? So again, just to walk through the code, we're going to initialize an integer, x equals 7 here. We're going to assign the address of x to a pointer, p of x, which can store integers. It's an integer pointer. And then I'm going to dereference p of x and assign it to 42. So go ahead and pause and think about what the value is going to be. And even better, go ahead and try to write this example, think about it, run it, and then see if it tests your assumption. All right. So I hope you paused and thought about it for a moment here. And I'm actually going to run it for you so you can see. Now you got a little sneak peek depending on how fast your eyes were here. Uh, but let's go ahead and open up dereference here to the sample. And let's go ahead and try to uh, compile it. And I'll make sure I go away here so you can see the compilation. <clears throat> so here we are. This is dereference2, excuse me. And I'll go ahead and run the program here. So the answer is x's value is, last chance to think about it, and 3, 2, 1, the value is 42. So I hope this doesn't come as too big of a surprise to folks, but it does make sense that if p of x is storing the address of x and I dereference p of x, then in fact I am changing the memory at which I'm pointing to. All right, let's take it to the slideshow and just try to explain this uh, visually as well. So again, we saw here the address uh, is, uh, or excuse me, when we dereference p of x, we get the value 42. So the integer value in x changes because we store x's address in p of x, and when we do reference, we follow the pointer to that value and modify the value 42. You'd like to see it in a sentence. Okay, another way to think about this, and again, you don't have to do this, but maybe it would make sense for folks who are learning this is if you wrapped the thing that you're dereferencing in parentheses. That, in a way, shows you the order of operations that's going to happen first, meaning when I'm dereferencing p of x, I'm, I'm saying, hey, go to my address where I'm at and retrieve the, the value there and then do the reassignment to 42. 
And maybe that's helpful for folks. You don't have to do this. In fact, when you dereference, that has a higher order of precedence than the assignment operator. So this left side operation will happen uh, first. Again, if you want to think about the asterisk as an operator on P of X for dereferencing. OK, so just a little note there or another visualization or cue that may be helpful. OK, so why does this work here? Uh, well, let's go ahead and look at a uh, more complex example. And, and in fact, be before we add any um, complexity here, truly try to understand this example. If you're able to convince yourself that this works by drawing some arrows on a box, then let's go ahead and try uh, this next example, which is a little bit more challenging. here. So this is called uh, pointer to a pointer. So again, if we are comfortable with the previous exercise, then we can try this exercise here. So in this first box, I'm going to initialize integer uh, x equals 7. And then I'm going to create a pointer assigned to store address of x here, just like we've always done. And then this is new here. I have an int star star, or int asterisk asterisk. So this is a pointer to integer pointers. And I've named this variable p underscore p of x equals ampersand p of x. So the p of x is a pointer to an integer pointer. Again, I read these uh, types sort of together, int star star. OK, so what would happen if we dereference p of x here and change the value? So if I did star star p underscore p of x equals 77, and then I can sort of print out what's going on here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop up over the code for a moment and say that maybe this is a little bit complicated, so let's actually try to draw. It. So let me go ahead and uh, pop out of here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, make the uh, screen a little bit smaller. And let's go ahead and uh, try to run and uh, draw this example. So this is the pointer to the pointer, just so I have the uh, code ready. And let's go ahead and uh, draw what's going on here. So in this one, um, and maybe the easiest way is here, so you can see the majority uh, of the code here. Uh, or at least this part here where the puzzle is. That's what I want you to focus on. That's what I'm going to be drawing here. Uh, and what I've got here is three boxes. So I can always just start with that. I've got my int x, and I've got my uh, int star p of x, and then I've got my int star star p underscore p of x. So again, if I just break things down conceptually, I know I have some different data types here that I'm declaring here. I'm going to highlight all of it because the uh, star is part of that uh, data type. And, uh, and they store something. OK, so what can they store? Well, x can hold uh, values here, or things like uh, integers. So you know, negative 2 billion something to 2 billion uh, on my system, right? Whatever I can cram into four bytes of unsigned data. This uh, box here has to store, well, the address of x. So I'm going to go ahead and give this an address, um, something reasonable. And this will have some other address. And maybe this will have some other address here. Okay, So all of our boxes have somewhere where they live. And remember that we're assigning this to the address of x. So this pointer, or what it stores, is in here. So 0x, 12. And this third one here, which is new here. That's what's at line 11. And it's sort of the confusing thing because we see two stars next to each other. Uh, we're getting a little bit wild here uh, at this point. Uh, but this one is, again, if I sort of think about this as just marking off this box, it's an integer uh, pointer to a pointer. Or rather, I could look at this last asterisk and say, what am I pointing to? Well, it's a integer pointer. And this says sort of, uh, pointer here. OK, so that could be one way that I uh, think about this uh, declaration. OK, so it has to point to the only thing that I can point to is this other integer pointers. So it's got to store the address at 0x20 here. OK, so let me go ahead and drop myself out of the screen. And let's just walk through this uh, code a little bit here. And I'll leave the picture on here because I think it'll be, uh, again, helpful for just understanding what's going on here. It's a little bit more, more of a wild uh, example, but not something that you wouldn't encounter uh, in the wild when working with pointers. 
So here it is, just so everything fits on one uh, screen nicely. And the question was, what happens if we dereference uh, p underscore p of x here? And why do I have two stars here? Well, I have two layers of indirection. I have to sort of chase, uh, in a sense, this pointer here to this address, this thing that I point to. And then I have to look at this value and dereference that and access this box here. Two layers of indirection because of two asterisks. So two pointers that I'm following here, uh, like I've illustrated uh, in the drawing. Here. So if I change this, what is X's value going to be? Well, again, if I'm following here and then saying, okay, follow again here, um, and then reassign that, I should be changing the value that's here. And that's pretty powerful that I can sort of hop through these chains and change values. Again, if you want to think about the actual uh, asterisk here as an operator, and this is sort of a math operation that's composing, right? I could sort of, um, I don't know if the uh, compiler will actually uh, like this, but uh, I could actually <clears throat> do this. Actually, this, this would be legal. So dereference, you know, P of P of X and get me this value and then dereference it again. Uh, I think it is actually going to let me uh, do this here. Let's go ahead and do pointer uh, to pointer. And this is our program. And it does allow me to do that. Okay, no problem there. So that can be one way to think about the uh, composition here, um, if, if it's helpful. And then again, I could wrap this in another parentheses. Um, and again, it, syntactically, this looks weird. Um, so once you get used to this, just star star p of x, two layers of indirection because two stars, two things that you're dereferencing. I'm dereferencing uh, here, and then I'm dereferencing again here. Okay, so x's value is, well, if we follow our uh, little chain here, should be 77. Star p of x, well, I'm just dereferencing once from p of x here, so I should get whatever lives in that box here. And then star star p of x, again, should be uh, matching. It should be 77. And if you want to look at this as just one layer of uh, interaction, when you just do star p underscore p of x, well, if I'm here and I do one layer of interaction, I should just get an address here. And same, if I just take the address of x, um, I would get uh, this value. And here, uh, where I have uh, zero levels of uh, indirection here. So I'm looking at lines 25 and 26. Um, what is the address stored here? In, um, or excuse me, in P underscore P of X, that would be here for line 25, and then uh, this value here. So let's go ahead and run it and confirm that we get uh, the value uh, 77, and I'll have to um, disappear for this so folks can see. And let's go ahead and run. And in fact, everything is 77. And we can see our different addresses. So uh, dereferencing p of p of x gives us this uh, value here. Uh, the address of x um, <clears throat> here. Well, again, the address is 12 here. Uh, and just to, just to make this clear, why are these two values the same? Well, if I dereference this, I'm grabbing the address stored in p of x, the thing that I point to, right, that was up here at line 11, and that should match with the address of x here. Okay, so that's what that uh, example is showing us here. And then finally, uh, when I just print out p underscore p of x, I get its actual address uh, where it lives, and the address of uh, p of x uh, also matches that. Why? Because, well, wherever uh, p underscore p of x is, or that is, I'm getting um, this this address out, or what p underscore p of x uh, actually stores, and that is the address. So that is uh, this thing here. Uh, so again, just to be clear, p underscore p of x, what do pointers hold? They hold addresses. What is the address of this actual uh, thing here? p of x, uh, 0x20, or in this case, this address here. Okay, so this is a little bit of a wild example. If you don't understand it, just at least know that you can have multiple levels of interaction with pointers. This is actually going to be very helpful when we think about creating our own different types of data, for instance, 
and different types of data structures where we might want to chain things together and perhaps um, walk through those chains using pointers. Okay, let's go ahead and continue with our presentation to see where we left off here. We still have plenty more to go. And again, why is this a big deal? Well, what I've really shown you how to do with pointers is how to share data. We don't really have any other mechanism to, you know, reasonably or efficiently do that. Um, well, at least depending on what point you are in your C and C++ career. Uh, pointers are a great way that you can have multiple values updated in a sense by just one change, right? Anytime we update X, we're effectively updating those two other pointers. So allow me to uh, walk you through some more code on a slide here. And um, I'm going to walk you through it here in the uh, presentation, and then I'll show you the actual code because we have access to that. I'm not limited by uh, presentations. I have it all here. So the new idea here is that I'm going to have three structures. Um, I also want to show you how to work with structs and pointers in this particular example. Uh, but in this struct, I have a person, and they're just going to have a nickname. So some string in C++ is fine. You could give this any variable you want, but a nickname. Uh, then I'll have a company here. And that's going to have a pointer to a person. So one of these structs above here. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have a structure for friends here. And friends will also have uh, one friend for now. You could add others, but for now, let's just keep things simple and have one friend here. And that is also a pointer to uh, some sort of person here. Again, person, asterisk right after, the types are connected. OK, so first, let's create an object here. Uh, person, that's going to be uh, me, Michael here, and I'll um, initiate uh, or initialize the nickname to be Michael here. And then I create my person, uh, my fake twin brother, and a company, and my friends as well. So here it is uh, all in one slide so that you can see. Again, the key that the most important thing is this person here, Michael, that we've created on line 18. Now, let's go ahead and initialize our pointers, because remember, in these structures here, I had these um, pointers to person here. And let's go ahead and set these up. So Mike, my fake twin brother, is also just a person or a pointer to a person. And I'll assign that the address of Michael. And then for each of these fields here, person, uh, CEO, that's a pointer. So that could be, that could store an address of Michael. And my friends, dot friend one is also a pointer to a person. So that could store the address of Michael. And if I go ahead and walk through this code, and let's say I do an update here. And this is the key part of this example, that I do michael.nickname, and I update it to Mike. So now, if I print out my fake twin brother also is, and then I dereference the person, access their nickname, what will I get here? And likewise, I can dereference it in another way, and I'll highlight this, but I can just use an arrow instead of this syntax. These lines 32 and 33 are actually the same. Uh, and then lines 35 and 36, I am essentially doing the same thing. I'm saying my employer access the CEO field, and then I need to dereference that. And I do that with the arrow and simultaneously accessing the field nickname. And all the results are Mike. And again, what's really, really powerful about this example is at line 19, I just have one person named uh, Michael with the nickname Michael. And on lines 26, 27, and 28, I assign the address of each of these person pointers for the respective uh, object types or their fields to Michael. So in a sense, what I've done here is one update but in effect, it's changed four other values. My uh, fake twin brother, the CEO uh, field, the friend field, and then, of course, uh, Michael himself, uh, our original object, our original person at line 18. So that's really, really powerful. So here's all the code in one slide. Let me go ahead and just uh, walk you through uh, the example um, as well. And then I'll show you the uh, syntax and why it's the same here. So let me go ahead and refresh this. So this is called uh, sharing the example that we just did, where we have our person structure. And I'll just quickly walk you through this as well. So here's our structures that we have here. Again, paying attention that these are pointers to a person. 
we create me, and then I set up the nickname here. I, I just create a pointer here for demonstration purposes. My employer, which has a field that's a person pointer. Uh, friends, which also has a field that's a person pointer as well. And then I do the assignment of each of those pointers to the address of some other person, which happens to be Michael here. I update the nickname for one of the fields, and then when I run this, uh, I get the following result. So let's go ahead and compile sharing and see what we get here. And I'll go ahead and run this. And again, this was the point of this example that we get the same result every time here because all of our pointers point to the same piece of memory. So again, this is why it was important for us to be thinking about memory, where our arrows are pointing. And this is a great example to try to draw out if you want to, again, understand what's going on in this program or if you're having trouble uh, understanding it. Now, there was a little bit of wonkiness with this syntax here. This line here is actually the exact same thing as here. In C++, there's a syntactic sugar where if you want to dereference and then access the field, you can do that with an arrow. So here I have dereference because my fake twin brother, if I go ahead and look at the code here, is a pointer. So I've got to dereference it anytime I want one of the uh, to get a value back. And then I do dot to access one of the fields, which is nickname here. And then I can print it out here. I can do that in one step by just using the arrow syntax. That's the preferred uh, mechanism here. So that's what I'm going to show on this slide, that these are the same things. You can pause and read the slide if you'd want uh, to see the details that I just explained. OK, let's go ahead and move on here. So at this point, I think we have the basic tools of a pointer. And again, the power here is that we can share data with our pointers. And one way that pointers are also powerful because they're storing addresses, and if you want to think about this as sharing or just passing along data, is to think about what happens when we pass pointers into functions. So let's go ahead and try this out. Let's see what happens. And I'm going to define a few terms here that are going to be important for us to keep track of. This is just how the C++ language works. So let's go ahead and take a look. So passing pointers into functions. We have something called pass by pointer. And well, this is actually going to be the same thing that I show you, but let's go ahead and just look at this example here. I'm going to compare two functions here, one that takes an integer parameter and one that takes an integer pointer parameter. So the first one here uh, that I labeled pass by value. Pass by value is an important key term. You can search or Google it if you don't understand it after this presentation. But it basically means that any time we pass in a variable, we make a copy of it. It's not the actual variable that's been passed in. Uh, and the second example here, pass by pointer, well, it's the same thing as pass by value. I'm making a copy of this pointer here. But the pointer happens to hold an address of something that might be living elsewhere. So keep that in mind. I'm going to re-explain those ideas and then give you a little exercise to see if you understand. OK, so we'll notice that each of these functions are named in this particular way, pass by value, pass by pointer, so you learn these sort of semantics here. And our goal is going to be to see what happens in this code. I have x equal 5, y, x, or excuse me, y equals 6 here, and then I call pass by value here with x and then pass by pointer with the address of y. Why the address of y? Well, I'm passing in a pointer here. And pointers store addresses, so I need to get the address of y in order to satisfy that we are storing an address here in this thing called in pointer. So pass by value means whenever we pass in a value, a copy of that value is made. So this means that the address of x at line 14 is going to be different than at line 6. So this thing here at line 14 is a different x than here. Even though we've named them the same, this is just a way to refer to the copy of x here. In fact, if it makes you more comfortable, you might type in this example, and instead of calling this x, call it x underscore copy, so that you realize that you're assigning x underscore copy to this value 9999 here. And then when the function returns, well, you'll have to think about what that is going to give you. A pass by pointer is actually pass by value. It's the same thing. However, the value that a pointer holds is an actual address of y. So that is what's located at line 15, right? I'm saying right here 
give me the address of y here, this thing here, and store that in the copy here. And then if I dereference, that means follow to the thing that I'm pointing to, retrieve uh, the value at that address, and then assign it to 9999, what is y going to be here? And I'll give you a moment to think about this. If you thought about this, again, pass by value and pass by pointer semantically are the same thing, but we can give them different names. What do you predict the output of X and Y are going to be at lines uh, 17? That's here and lines uh, 19 here. And if you've paused and taken a moment to think about what's going to be here at line 17 and what's going to be here at line 19, the answer is, well, X is still 5 and Y is now 9999. Again, this is an important example to understand here because we understand that pointers hold addresses if I dereference that address, then I'm actually dereferencing whatever memory I point to, so long as it exists somewhere in our program, and we'll talk about that later. And I can reassign, just like we've been reassigning previously when I've dereferenced. Now there is a subtlety here for maybe folks who are at a more advanced level, that if I just assign this pointer within here to another address, that actually wouldn't do anything. I'll let you revisit this talk again to think about that, but for now, just know that when I have an actual address here that I'm passing in, I can dereference it and modify the actual value of the thing I'm pointing to somewhere else in our program. So that's how we can have functions actually mutate or change the values of variables in some other scope in our code, meaning X and Y are in a different scope. They're within different curly braces, but they could still be modified within this other function here by passing them by pointer. Okay, so some notes on pass by pointer. Again, it's equivalent to pass by value, except you're able to mutate values to the address of pointer stores. And again, my sort of teaching note here is I like to teach pass by pointer and give it that name because it is slightly different than um, in what we're trying to achieve, but it's, it's still making a copy of the variable. So that's important that you uh, understand that. Okay, so you'll see this a lot in various c style apis again you're probably watching this talk as a c plus plus programmer but maybe you'll interface with c uh, so the following here is just a sort of wild example of what you might see in your code here where you have lots of pointers being passed in here and maybe even some of those values are denoted as out so this is one way that you could sort of have multiple return values i would say this is sort of dangerous so just be a little bit careful but it's important to know pass by pointer because if you're going to be working with C code later on or you're watching this as a C programmer, this is your style of coding for taking in inputs and maybe retrieving multiple outputs, although it would probably be preferable to return a struct or something if you need multiple returns. Anyway, my C++ folks will also know something about pass by reference, which is probably a separate video, but I will mention it uh, at the end. Okay, so we've learned about pointer variables, we've learned about dereferencing, and we've learned about pointers as parameters. So now let's talk about pointers versus arrays, and then as well, dynamically allocated arrays. Okay, so pointers and arrays here. I'm gonna go ahead and have us visualize memory here for a little bit, and I'm just drawing it as a grid. Everything that we talked about previously is still the same, meaning a memory, or excuse me, our memory is just sort of a linear set of addresses labeled one after the other but i just need some more room here so i'm going to draw it as a grid and know that you know this zigzag just continues into one contiguous uh line here or, or array of addresses okay so again also recall that we have the size of operator which we learned about before and that allows us to store different types of memory so again you can use size of for many different things here this example is a little bit interesting because i can have user define types um, and also figure out their size up. That's always good to do this because you don't know how the compiler is going to or how many bytes it's going to take to represent three integers here and then three chars. Uh, that's hard for us to sort of figure out or maybe our structures are bigger or smaller or maybe we decide to rearrange where the uh, integers and chars are in a later refactoring, um, which can also affect the size uh, of our type. So you'll see here at line 23, uh, I have this user defined type here. Uh, I'm actually going to run this uh, example here 
uh, for the uh, size of, just to show you that here. And that's the third example here, just to highlight this user-defined uh, type here. Because uh, I want you to see what the size is, and um, I think this is well worth noting uh, when we talk about uh, dynamically outcoded memory. So I'm going to run this, and you can see that it's 16 uh, bytes here to represent four integers and three characters here. Uh, now let me go ahead and, you know, why is it 16 when if you really add these up, there's 15? Well, there could be padding bytes or, or different things like that. So again, you have to be a little bit careful, and this is why we just like using uh, size of here. So let's say I modify this. Oops. Uh, D and E give myself two more bytes. Uh, and I'll recompile this, rerun it, and you'll see that now we've only added two bytes, but it's uh, 20 here. So again, use size of. It's it's a good habit to um, be using here. Okay, so I'll undo these changes so you have the original uh, in the code base, but you can play around with size of there, as always. Okay, so we know again that different types have different sizes, and again, it might vary based off of your architecture, so you always want to check. And here's just a few examples of how our uh, memory fills up. Oops, and I'll get rid of that Q&A. Uh, but you can see that we have four bytes for X, one byte for A, and then, you know, four bytes for our float here and so on. So with arrays, you know, similarly, we typically, if we want to create something, we don't want to write out each of the variables, but we just use this array notation here. So I've got an array here of six shorts. If you haven't worked with a short before, it's just a smaller integer, and it's typically two bytes. So it gives us a smaller range of values that we can represent. So what's this going to look like? Again, just walking through uh, the code here, we're going to allocate six shorts. And because it's array, these are a contiguous block of memory. So six shorts, each two bytes gives us 12 bytes total. Each of these boxes represents one byte. We haven't populated with them uh, any data. So let's go ahead and do that here. So I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on here that I've initialized in this array. So now I can see the individual uh, shorts here and their values. So if I create a pointer to a short here, and again, I'm going to use P underscore S, and this is just, again, based off of what we've learned and how I like to name things, I should be able to individually address each of these different bytes here. So let's go ahead and do that in our example. So I create my pointer here to one of the array elements here. And I'm going to take the uh, pointer. Here it is created here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Still eight bytes. And then I'll point to the address of our second index here. Again, we're uh, zero index, so zero, one, two. And I point to it. No problem there. And I can repoint this pointer or assign it to something else. And that points to a different box. I'll flip back and forth between these. So we can see here, they point to index of two, and then we just point it somewhere else here. Okay, now what happens if I try to increment a pointer? And this is something known as pointer arithmetic. Now, fair warning, pointer arithmetic works a little bit different with pointers. We're not just able to add one per se, we do it in a specific way. So pay attention to this example. So. This time, we're going to have a pointer to the start of our array. You can see the flashing red arrow here uh, to indicate that uh, from our pointer to this start of this array here. And then if I increment it, note that we point to the next short here. So now I'm pointing to index 1 here. And then I'm pointing to the second index, the third index, the fourth index, and the fifth index, technically at the very start of each of these boxes here. So. Because our pointer type, p underscore s, that's our pointer here, is two bytes, whenever I do the plus plus operator, we're shifting two bytes from our original location. Again, this is really important to understand with pointers here. When I'm incrementing a pointer, if it's two bytes, which we had a short of, then every time I do plus plus, I'm moving two bytes at a time. That's why you saw how we could hop to the next index in an array. And this is pretty cool. It's actually a pretty powerful uh, trick that we can use to work with pointers and how they relate to arrays. So when we think about arrays, what we're really doing is working with memory. Again, I told you it'd be important to try to visualize memory here, but 
an array is a contiguous block of memory, just as we've drawn out here. And since it is memory, it must have an address. And if I dereference the value at that address, I get back the value in our array. And that's essentially what's going on here. So let me go ahead and just show it to you in another form so you can see how this breaks down. So here, uh, we could look at this, or we could sort of understand this in, in a different way and say the number of times we incremented p underscore of s in that previous example was the offset into our array that was here that we wanted to hop into uh, in our example. So in other words, we could just offset our, um, po our pointer by just adding the specific value we want and then dereferencing it. And this is the exact syntax that we could use here. We could just say, okay, I'm going to create uh, my array here. That's at line uh, eight here. And then if I just say, hey, give me my array plus zero, and then dereference that value, that would give me the zeroth index. Or I could say plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, and plus five would give me this value here. Plus four, plus three, plus two, plus one, plus zero here, okay? So this is the exact same syntax uh, that I'm going to show here, and I'll move out of the way here. This here is just a more verbose or, you know, fully explained version of how we usually use arrays with the uh, bracket operators. In fact, the bracket operators really mean dereference at a specific index. So again, this is the same as the bracket operators. Okay, so remember, an array is just a contiguous chunk of memory. Arrays are a homogeneous data structure, meaning these are all shorts here. I don't have different data types here. And this uh, bracket notation here, where I do array and then the left bracket zero bracket, is just the same meaning as dereference. And I can use pointer arithmetic. I could use plus plus uh, if I had a pointer here, or I could just use the array and do plus one, you know, plus seven. Uh, if I have a pointer, I could do minus two and sort of move two backwards. Again, as long as I'm within the legal dimensions of an array. All right. Now, this is a sort of hot, hot topic in terms of are arrays just pointers then? or our pointers arrays. So let's try to get our terminology straight. And again, if you don't care for now, that's okay. But um, there is something known as array decay to pointer. Okay, so now while traversing our array, when we're using the pointer arithmetic here, uh, in doing at line 21 p underscore s plus plus, there was, you know, this sort of subtle thing that we were doing. Since we were just adding to a, a pointer, our array, we sort of lost uh, information of the dimensionality, meaning how many elements we have in the array, because we just had a pointer. OK, so from our pointer P underscore S, we can set it equal to an array, which assigns it the index of the zero element essentially here at 18. And then we were incrementing through. Uh, but this is just a uh, pointer. So if you want to try to keep this straight or just know that the keyword search is array decay to pointer, uh, the title of this slide here and want to read more, uh, this is what's going on. So I'm actually going to run this example um, as well so we can see uh, the decay here. And I can just kind of uh, explain it um, as well as what we see on the slide here. Um, but really, I'm going to use my size of operator just to keep things straight here. So let me go ahead and just recompile this. So we see it works. And if I run it, what I see is, well, I'm able to figure out the size of this array here because, well, when this is locally in scope, I see that it's six elements. It's a short six elements times two gives me 12 bytes here. So I have the size of here. Um, and I can do that when this is in the same scope as uh, would we use the size of operator. But when I'm taking the size of the address of something, meaning an address, so it must be stored in eight bytes, I, I'm essentially sort of treating this like a uh, pointer here. So um, <clears throat> these are slightly different here, array versus ampersand array. Um, if this was confusing and you don't care for now, that's, that's fine. Um, but just know that when you have a pointer inside of an array, you don't have any notion of how big that array is, right? You just have the pointer. 
the second thing that you can sort of think about is I can't assign an array equal to a pointer, but I can assign an address of one of the array elements into a pointer. OK, if that helps make sense that pointers and arrays are different things. Now, when I pass pointers as parameters, arrays do decay to pointers, OK, and function parameters. Why is this? Well, go ahead and think about for a moment what information we lose. And if you thought about it for even just a moment here, again, if I'm just passing a pointer into a function, I have no notion over how big that array is. OK, so here's an example here where I've got arrays that can decay to pointers as function parameters. And I've just named this function array decay and I'm passing in one short here. And again, in this example on the right uh, is an example of somebody trying to pass in an array as a parameter. You know, maybe we would want to pass in some array into some other function and you know, sum up the total of the elements, some sort of example like that. So personally, you probably shouldn't, if you're watching this as a C++ programmer, pass in raw arrays, maybe use a different data structure vector if that's allowed. But if you do have to, you do have to pass in some sort of dimensions of this array so you know how big it is. OK, and if you run this again, you'll see that the size of the array here uh, at line seven, which prints out uh, below here, prints out that this is eight bytes, proving that this is just a pointer here. Even though we are passing in our array here, which we know about uh, and can figure out that it's again 12 bytes because locally in scope, I have six shorts. So six shorts times two is 12 bytes. That's where the 12 comes from. Uh, and that can be deduced here at line 17. But when I pass in the array here as a function, it decays into a pointer. Pointers just store addresses. OK, and they take eight bytes. OK, so here's the fix for the example. Just pass in the size. You could pass as an integer, a preferred style is to use size underscore t, because you know it's got to be a positive value, uh, and then just utilize your array uh, appropriately. So here's the example, just printing out all the elements from our array here. And essentially what this is doing here, since I have the pointer here, and I'm using this bracket syntax, which again is just saying, hey, offset from my pointer this amount of times, uh, so I time 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on times the data size and retrieve the right value there. OK, that's what the brackets are doing. And this is just a for fun example. If you want to do something very crazy and you don't want to type in the uh, parameter size, I think this isn't appropriate for uh, beginners watching this. Um, so I'm just going to uh, skip this here. But you could use template parameters or advanced things like that. Uh, this is a bad idea because you start generating lots of code for all of your different sizes of arrays. So here's just a little technique. You can revisit this talk after you understand pointers to see. All right, so let's talk about dynamically allocated arrays for a moment. And this is when we need pointers to point to a chunk of memory that an allocator gives us, meaning every time you use new. Again, if you're coming from the C programming world, this is when you use something like malloc, for instance. So you need pointers, in a sense, when you're dynamically allocating memory to be able to point to a chunk of memory that your operating system or whatever allocator, meaning new, has given you. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so again, dynamically allocated arrays, this is when we use something like new. So again, recall that indexing into arrays works by dereferencing at a specific offset. Again, the element we access the data type size multiplied by the index. OK, so how far we want to sort of shift our pointer in that array and then retrieve some element. So let's see how this works with dynamically allocated arrays. OK, so here's an example where I'm just going to allocate three integers uh, and then I have my delete here. So ints are going to be or rather the integer pointer here is eight bytes. So here it is. Integer pointer has been created. And my array ints on my machine are four bytes. I asked for three of them, so I need 12 bytes of memory here. OK, and they could be placed anywhere. I don't know where these are going to be placed. It's not guaranteed that they'll be placed right next to uh, this pointer. So I've just positioned them elsewhere. And then my int pointer is going to point to this first uh, int. To be very specific, it would point to this first uh, box here. Then we get offset by four each time to get the uh, actual value. 
And when I delete, we essentially clean up this memory here that's in our new array here. Now note the pointer still might be pointing to something. You know, maybe it's garbage in here. And so we have to be careful if we try to use anything in this array later on. And we'll talk about some of those pitfalls later on. Okay, so here's round two. And I'll just show another example here where I create my int array here. And I'm going to create three new integers. This time I'm going to initialize them to three different values. And then I'll create a second integer pointer and assign it to the int array. So this means they're both pointing to the same memory. Because when I do this assignment here, int array two is pointing to, well, what's at line six here? So again, this is like what we are doing where we have uh, sharing here, two pointers pointing to the same uh, piece of data. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here at line 14 is just print out what one of the values is. So this is just incrementing between zero with the first value one, then two. So we would expect at index one, the value will be one here. And then I'll delete the array. And then recall that int array two is also pointing to the uh, array here, uh, int array. And well, what is the value gonna be here? If I've already deleted this memory here and they're pointing to the same location. Well, here's what I get in the program. And this is a little bit tricky, but this is sort of a memory error here. And so I run this program and you'll see that after I do or before I do the delete, rather, I have a value of one. And after the delete, I have a value of zero. So it's a little bit tricky, but we have to think about which pointer owns the memory in a sense here. Because if I have two pointers pointing to the same uh, piece of memory here, int array two is pointing to where int array is, but int array is the one that deleted it. Well, I probably should have updated in two or, you know, figure out how to do that. And again, this could be a little bit tricky. And now I'm thinking about ownership, which, you know, can be a, a tricky topic. But, but the question I'm asking is, you know, if int array allocated the memory, it's probably in charge of deleting it, which is good. We could have also deleted it through int array two, if you want to try that in the example. But, but we need to sort of notify or let the other pointers know, hey, this data that you're sharing is gone. <laughs> so don't try to uh, dereference it, okay? So now we have this idea of ownership uh, with our memory. Okay, so this sort of brings us to some of the ideas of the uh, challenges with pitfalls and some of our tools here. So null pointer here is a type where we could sort of assign a pointer that doesn't point to anything. Okay, and this is a special C++11 type. C programmers are just going to use capital null or maybe zero, uh, depending on what C compiler you're using. But for C++11 and beyond, we like null pointer here. Okay, so what if a pointer points to nothing here? So on line seven here, I've got an example where I have in star p of x equals null pointer. And so if I dereference this p of x, and again, you can think of null pointer as the address at zero, so effectively nothing, and I try to dereference, well, I get this segmentation fault. And let me go ahead and run this example. This is a fun enough uh, example to uh, run. And sometimes uh, we uh, want to be able to uh, fix our bugs here. So this example is called null uh, pointer .cpp. And let's go ahead and try to run it. No pointer .cpp. So it compiles. And again, if I am dereferencing a null pointer, I get a segmentation fault, which is basically a crash that says, hey, you don't own the memory at address zero, whatever that happens to be on your system. So the safest thing for me to do is just crash the program. Okay, it's not terrible in the sense that we can um, recover, we can rerun our program and try to identify where this is, which I'll talk about. Um, but, but we do want to try to avoid this type of thing from happening, right? If our program's crashing, that's not very satisfactory to our clients here. So let's go ahead and uh, move a little bit forward here. And so the tip is we can check for null pointers by saying, hey, if null pointer is not equal to p of x, and I usually like to put null pointer first uh, to make sure that I don't accidentally just assign if I forget an equal sign. Uh, then I then I can actually do this action. So null pointer provides some uh, additional type safety versus using zero. 
And then this also, this check here gives us a little bit of memory safety to check that we are not dereferencing a null pointer because there's no value there. So our system will just crash. Okay, and this leads me to some of the pitfalls of the pointer. So like you'll see in this uh, example here where we had the segmentation fault or the actual code up here, there's some common problems with pointers that we would want to watch out for and why folks often think they're scary, but you're not going to be scared because you're watching this training and hopefully you've made it this far in the video and are excited about pointers power as opposed to uh, some of the things we're going to talk about here. So again, with great power comes great responsibility. Okay, so these are the common sort of uh, pointer pitfalls. And I've got some links to some other talks if you want to uh, search for these on say YouTube or whatever platform you like. And I'll show you in a slide or two the pitfalls. So here, one of the pitfalls is memory leaks. And a memory leak is when we forget to reclaim our memory. So to the right is an example of that. Here I am allocating some memory here. Okay, 1000 integers, so that's 4000 bytes. Insert each four bytes in my system. And then maybe I have a while loop in my program. This would be very common in a game or a server or some program that's running forever. And I just keep allocating integers, but never deleting them within the scope that they were allocated. This is bad. This is a memory leak. <laughs> this means that we're not able to recover memory because we were allocating it, but then we lose the pointer that was pointing to the chunk of memory. So the memory is just sort of hanging out in our process. And this is going to slow down our machines. If you run this program, it might crash your machine. So hit control C or, or kill this program in the uh, task manager, fair warning, um, to make sure that it doesn't crash your program. So we want to learn about <laughs> memory leaks. Um, eventually, when you do terminate this program, as I have in the footnote here, the operating system will clean things up, but it's up to the operating system when that happens. So how can you detect these errors? Well, if you have a modern compiler like Clang 10 or one of the newer GCCs, they have these sanitizers here that you can actually run here and help check for uh, memory leaks. And if you compile with dash G when you compile your programs, you'll have debugging symbols. And often these tools here can tell you where memory leaks occur, the exact line of the thing that you allocated. So in this example, it says leak.cpp. Um, um, 9 and 19. So if I go back here uh, and look at this uh, program here, um, it looks like the, well, it looks like I added a line here, but uh, it's detecting this uh, memory leak here. Okay, that 4,000 bytes leak allocation. There's actually more um, later here, but that's the, the direct leak here. Okay, so you can use this tool. Valgrin users on uh, Linux uh, might have this tool available. It's relatively easy to install. That also will tell you where things uh, leaked, but you need to use your debugging symbols. Now, the other problem you can have with pointers is what's known as a dangling pointer, and those arise when we point to the address of a value that may not exist. Okay, so this is dangerous. This, um, you know, we do not want to do this. <laughs> this is another dangerous one here. Our tools like the sanitizers and Valgrind can help us, uh, but these are tricky sometimes. So the thing is, if I do what I'm doing here at line uh, 12 here, I have dangling pointer one equals, well, this function dangerously return local value. So this function here, dangerously return local value, again, the name as a hint here, I'm just creating a local variable here and returning the address to the local variable here. So I'm returning a pointer here and storing it. And then I try to dereference that value. Again, the scope that this local variable is created, char c, it's going to go away at line 9. In other words, it'll be deleted, it doesn't exist, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't, maybe it changes, whatever. Um, so the memory that you're looking at is just not there. So that's a very uh, dangerous thing. And we say that this is a dangling pointer. It's pointing to something that existed at one time for a moment, and then it disappears. So your compilers, um, if you're using G++ like I did in this example, it will give you warning, address of local variable C return. And that's the hint here, that it's a local variable. Again, other tools like Valgren or the sanitizers may help you with this. The other problem that you may run into is what's known as a double free. So a double free occurs when we're sharing data between two or more pointers. And again, we're trying to be good and maybe avoid things like memory leaks, but we free the data twice. 
So in this example, I have a float here, F1, and I'm pointing to 100 integers here. Or excuse me, 100 floating point values. And F2, I'm going to say, hey, points to, well, whatever F1 is. So they're pointing to the same data here. Then I delete F2, uh, which was pointing to this data that I've allocated in line 8. And I set it to a null pointer. And then I delete F1 again. Well, F2 was pointing to the same thing that F1 was, and it's already been deleted. And I'm also trying to be good. And then maybe I try to delete again, you know, later on in my program. Now, note, sometimes you'll get a crash on your system for this. This is what's known as a double free. My Linux system, I actually couldn't get a crash here because um, the system will let me delete essentially a null or a zero value for the pointer here. But uh, that's not guaranteed, or if you're doing more C programming or using an older version of a C++ compiler, this might not be the case, or on perhaps a different platform or a phone or whatever. Um, so you do have to be careful here. Usually you'll get some sort of abort or double free, uh, not allowed um, if this happens. Okay, and there are more types of things to watch out for, and the ISO CPP guide has a pretty good uh, documentation of how to deal with memory management and pointers. Okay, now, maybe this is a little bit too much and you say, oh, you know, there's a lot of problems with pointers. I just don't want to use them. I made it this far in the video and I'm still scared. The good news is that you can mitigate some of these issues with a wrapper class. So you can either write your own, like I've done here, and I'm not even really going to bother to talk about this code, but I've essentially just started sketching a very quick version of a smart pointer. So this is called Mike's Safe Pointer, or Mike's Smart Pointer would be another way to call it. It's not production code, but you could go ahead and look. And basically the idea is I have a class here for some type here, any integer pointer type, and I want to be able to keep track of the amount of pointers that point to this or use this particular pointer. Now, again, there is not much point in me talking about this code because I just want to point you to the standard library uh, for C++11 or beyond to talk about smart pointers. So let's go ahead and get smart with our smart pointers. And I encourage you to use these with modern C++. I do truly believe you have to understand regular or raw pointers before you start using these so you can either appreciate them um, at some level. Now, whether you learn smart pointers first or raw, I guess may not matter in an introductory course, but you do need to know behind the scenes that smart pointers are just wrapping regular pointers and trying to protect you from some of those issues that I showed, those pitfalls of memory leaks, uh, dangling pointers, and so on. So just so you're aware, and for a future talk, a smart pointer is some sort of container in C++ that wraps a pointer. So it's sort of a proxy in the sense that we can use it in place of other pointers. So we have three types here. STUD, or the standard, colon, colon, unique pointer, STUD shared pointer, and STUD weak pointer. Now, what problem does a pointer solve? Well, you don't have to call it delete explicitly. You can avoid calling new. Um, instead, you have these other functions called make underscore shared or make underscore unique. And then we're all ultimately enforcing some sort of constraint with these smart pointers. So if I go back here, um, you know, depending on what, whether you're using unique pointer, shared pointer, or weak pointer, you now have to make a decision which maybe introduces some complexity, but you get some safety with that decision. So let's go ahead and continue on here. So again, behind the scenes, what a smart pointer is really doing for you is enforcing some constraints. So usually it's counting how many references you have to that particular pointer. Or maybe it's enforcing uniqueness as unique pointer is, meaning only one thing can uh, point to it. Um, and you can even get into some other use cases where when you create the pointer, it'll handle things like exceptions. So when in C++ you get to uh, using exceptions, make underscore share could be safer than just calling the new operator, for instance. So let's go ahead and just look at a few examples. And perhaps this is a different talk in the future. Go ahead and comment below if you'd like to learn more about smart pointers here. But just so you know and have an example, unique pointer is a scoped pointer, meaning when it goes out of scope, it will be automatically deleted. So you never need to use delete with these unique pointers here. So we can't copy them. And this means that we avoid the double free issue. So this could be your default if you want to be very careful with your pointers. So at line 25, let's just go ahead and take a look at this. So I've created some 
object here. I have a class for it with the constructor and the destructor. And I just print out when the constructor is called and when the destructor is called. That could be a useful way to just understand what's going on in your program. And then what you'll see in this example when I run it is that we automatically delete the memory here for our new object here at line 29. And then likewise at line 34 through 36, which is the preferred style, I have this object pointer that I've recreated. It's in a different scope here. And I call make underscore unique. So it does the same thing here, creating a new object, but with make underscore unique. And that'll handle weird instances of, say, if you have a uh, exception that happens to be thrown when you allocate memory because you run out of memory or something. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, just uh, write up this example. Uh, and this one, actually, I will uh, write up here because I don't have it here. So we'll write it from scratch. Uh, so we need a main here. We need our return value. And let's go ahead and just give this the name. We'll call this unique CPP. And I'm going to include for output purposes, IO screen, and I'm going to include memory. This is where our unique pointer comes from. This is the library here. In fact, all of our smart pointers come from memory. I'm going to go ahead and create a class just so we have something interesting that's allocated. And this is also helpful to use when you're uh, learning about these smart pointers, just to have a concrete example. So let me go ahead and pop up on the screen so you can see what's going on. And I'm just going to write this in one file so it's easy um, in this uh, tiny example here. And let's go ahead and print out the constructor. And let's do an line here. And we need our uh, destructor as well. So here's the uh, destructor. Okay, so we have some class, we have some interesting enough object that we can allocate. So let me go ahead and show the uh, different ways that we can create our uh, unique pointers. So I'm gonna just create a scope here and I can do that with the uh, curly braces and let's go ahead and create our unique pointer. So the pointer that we want to create is for an object. So this is the actual type here. There's no asterisk here, which might throw you off from all the other things that we've learned so far. Um, but this is just the pointer. And then I'm going to give this some name. Uh, let, let's just go ahead. I'll deviate a little bit from the example here. Just do P um, underscore unique pointer here. OK, so this is a unique pointer. We've got it sort of in the name here. And then we can construct this by calling explicitly new on the object here. So let's go ahead and just run this example. And first, I want to just sort of show that this won't work on older versions of C++ here. Uh, so let me go ahead and do this. And we're going to get a bunch of errors if you compile with 03. So we need at least uh, C++ 11 for this. Um, and again, I always prefer to use uh, a newer compiler such as 17. So here it all is in one line. This compiles just fine. Uh, let me get rid of myself here for a moment and we'll go ahead and uh, run this. And you can see the constructor is called and the destructor is called. So I didn't explicitly call delete anywhere here, but the destructor was in fact called. And in fact, if I create some other pointer here, for example, uh, unique pointer two here, and let's go ahead and try to assign it to uh, unique pointer here. Let's see what happens. Let's just do a little uh, experiment and I'll try to uh, rerun this and you'll get the error here. So let me show you what that error is and I'll say use of deleted function std unique pointer um, here. So it's complaining about this. And this is the important note because a unique pointer means I can't point uh, to something else other than you know what I was uh, declared with. Um, you know, I guess I could uh, maybe uh, assign this to, you know, it basically it's deleted the uh, copy constructor that would be called here when I'm creating this because, you know, this thing already exists here, okay? This this just isn't allowed. So um, it's been uh, deleted here, the, the copy constructor. It's showing you here, um, if you've implemented your own copy constructor, that this is deleted. So this is the powerful idea behind unique pointers. This is what I'm getting at when I talk about constraints being enforced. So I'll go ahead and move away so you can see this again. Um, and let me um, go ahead and just copy uh, this example here. And I want to just show you the second uh, syntax here. So you have it 
uh, stud unique, or excuse me, make unique object. And this will do exactly the same thing as line 15 here. The difference is it'll handle uh, if there are exceptions. So we've sort of written within this function. So instead of calling new and just retrieving some memory and allocating it here, uh, we're doing this through a function that can uh, handle exceptions. Um, so depending on your use case, if you need that, that will also work. So here you can see the constructor, destructor, constructor, destructor as we leave scope. Again, this is pretty cool. I'll just show the example with the uh, unique pointer here. And you can do sort of the same things with make shared. Again, try these examples out so that you actually learn what's going on here in the examples that I'm showing. All right, so that's unique pointer, one of our smart pointers. Uh, that is a new uh, feature here. We've also got shared pointer. And this one, the difference is it allows you to point to multiple things here. So I'll just draw your attention to line 29 here where I have my shared object pointer and I can create my shared object pointer to here and I create this object and then I can point my original pointer to this uh, second one. So what this example is going to do here is it's going to allow you to have again multiple pointers pointing to the same data and it will safely delete itself as long as no other pointers are pointing to the same data. It's essentially doing some sort of reference counting uh, implementation here. OK, so that's what you have to be uh, keeping an eye on. So if nothing is pointing to this pointer, then when it goes out of scope, it can safely be deleted. Otherwise, that memory will stay intact. And you can actually print out how many times a pointer is in use. Uh, I believe it's called use underscore count uh, a function. Um, so you know, for folks who have used other languages like Java, this might be more familiar or um, a handy tool for you to uh, use, especially if you're having trouble with memory leaks. Now, there's a third type of smart pointer. And again, these probably demand their own talks, but weak underscore pointer um, is very similar to shared pointer, but it doesn't increase this reference count or meaning whenever I'm pointing another pointer, let's say I have 50 weak pointers and they all point to one shared pointer. As soon as that one shared pointer goes out of scope, that's fine to delete the memory. The 50 weak pointers might point to invalid memory. OK, so um, if I give you a little use case here, it's in tiny font, but pretend you have some game object in a video game that was blown up uh, mid midway through the game while other objects were communicating with it, meaning you have other pointers pointing to that object that's getting blown up. Uh, you could just use weak pointers. They're a little bit cheaper. Um, you know, or at least well, I would want to measure them. I, I believe they're a little bit more uh, lightweight, but but you could you're OK if those pointers become invalid or null. Um, and then you can just check if they're a null pointer or not. OK, so this allows you to sort of delete memory, perhaps sooner, but also to share your data. OK, and some of that data might be invalid, but that's what a weak pointer allows you to do. OK, so here's a weak pointer example, just so you can see um, how this is used. I've adapted this from the CPP reference uh, example and just added some annotations so that you can see again how this works. OK, now there is a type of uh, pointer or smart pointer that was uh, implemented. Um, auto underscore pointer. All you need to use um, or all you really need to know about this is it's deprecated. Don't use it. Um, yeah, that was easy. Just don't use this. Um, it's it's old and it's been deprecated. All right. So getting into the last topics here while we uh, wrap up uh, our discussion on pointers, our relatively full uh, discussion here is pointers and functions. So functions themselves have an address in memory. So it makes sense that we can also have pointers to these functions as well. So if you don't believe me, I'm using a tool here called NM, which basically just prints out the uh, symbols in an executable. So we've been using prog here. And if you look through this enough or just go to the highlighted orange box here, you can see that for this tiny program where I've written add and multiply, these functions add and multiply do have addresses and functions have to have addresses. They have to live somewhere. So it makes sense that they are here. So if I want, I can create and use a function pointer that is have a pointer to a function. And you might ask yourself why you might want to do this. Well, hopefully this example above will illustrate what happens. But 
uh, or why this is useful. But a very common use case is often in event-driven programming where you have some button that you press and you want a function to be called. Which function do you want to be called? Well, you know, you want to be able to divide, define or choose what that function is. So that's one very clear use case of where you need a function pointer. So you as a programmer can point to the actual function call that you want uh, for a particular function. So let's go ahead and just look at this simple example here where at line 14, I create a function pointer. Now the syntax is very weird or obscure at first. So I'm gonna work my way from inside out here. So I have a star here, which usually indicates pointer when I'm creating something, the name of this function pointer. So PFN underscore, so this is a pointer to some function. That's what the prefix is. That's a common prefix, PFN underscore arithmetic. So some arithmetic function that's I can point to. It takes two arguments, the thing that I can point to, two integer arguments, and returns an int. So if I look at the different functions that I have in this program, I have an int return type for add, that takes in two integer parameters, and for multiply, I have an int return type, and it takes in two integer parameters. So it makes sense that I can point to one of these functions here, either one of them. So at line 16, I'm going to point this to the add function. And then I'm going to call a standard C out my PFN underscore arithmetic, my function pointer, and then just supply parameters, and that'll effectively call the function that I'm pointing to, which happens to be add here. And then if I change that at line 19, and then point to some other function that has two integer input parameters, and one integer return type, which happens to be multiply, then I can use the same function call with the same parameters, and it'll execute the multiply code. So this is what we get here. So function pointers, again, are a powerful way to change the behavior of our program. So again, I like to think about this in the sort of graphical user interface or GUI or event-driven programming where you're clicking on a button and you want a certain function to execute. Now, modern C++, we have stood a function or standard function, which is a much nicer syntax than the sort of C-based uh, function pointer syntax. So I have std function here, and I have the return type followed by the arguments here. And then I can just create uh, whatever this is. I just prefixed it with an F, so I know that it's a function, uh, meaning it's just that something that's callable here. So add, this is the exact same example as before, but using the modern syntax. This tends to be less error prone for beginners, so uh, I like this uh, function or use of std function. At line four, you'll include functional to use this uh, syntax. All right, so there's lots of other odds and ends. These are probably notes for another talk, but I think this one's long enough. So go ahead in the comments, uh, like, subscribe uh, below, and make your suggestions if you'd like more videos on a particular topic that need uh, well explained. So we haven't talked about void pointers, casting pointers, um, uint pointer t, pointer diff, uh, many other things, but these are some other things that you can uh, sort of Google. Maybe how to work with multidimensional arrays. Uh, I did mention that I would talk about references. Uh, references are essentially pointers as well, except they're pointers that you can't change uh, what they're pointing to, right? You can't reassign uh, a reference, okay? So if you're a C++ programmer, you also know about pass by reference. Um, that's probably worth uh, another video. Uh, in the future here. Reference, we sort of think of like uh, an alias. All right, now I think it'll also be another video to talk about some of these different data structures, like a singly linked list. So I think I'm gonna cut this one off because it's been long enough. And again, in the comments, if you really want, I can do an in-depth implementation of singly linked list in C++ or C if you would prefer. So I do have an example in my slideshow talk and if you can read really small font, otherwise you can see it uh, on the slide. I'll disappear for a moment so you can pause if you want. But again, that code is uh, in the uh, link here. And uh, you can go ahead and see how to implement a link list. That's a really good exercise for seeing if you understand pointers to understand that. All right, so let me go ahead and get us ready to wrap up this talk here for what we've learned. Again, you've learned about raw pointers. I think it's important to know about them, how they work, and so on. So if you're a beginner, hopefully this cleared up some of the confusion on the syntax and how we use pointers. So you can understand what pointers are doing behind the scene, allowing you to share and pass around data and why that is powerful. And you do need to think about some things like the ownership of the pointer so that you can safely delete your memory and so forth. If you're an expert, hopefully this was a useful talk. If you found any flaws, go ahead and comment below and let me know. 
and I'll be sure to uh, do some more videos on that to uh, explain things more thoroughly or carefully if needed. So uh, a few more notes here that may be useful, again, uh, for teachers, educators, or just for uh, folks watching this. Again, you can think about uh, pointers as um, sort of, you know, you have a page in a book and your index is the pointer into a page in the book. And then that's where you access the contents. Um, I've also taught this as sort of thinking about integers or different data types um, as being stored at some uh, memory location. And then when you want to retrieve things with the Empress hand, uh, you again think of that as the address of operator. And you can think about these as mailboxes. So a mailbox has an address. And when you dereference, you get the actual value inside of the mailbox. OK, there's some materials of other useful talks here. Feel free to check out. Uh, depending on when you watch these, some of these will be live. Uh, and hopefully, um, if you're watching this well into the future, everything will be on uh, YouTube or some other platform. All right, folks, that's it. That was a rundown of pointers. I hope you found this really useful. Go ahead and uh, like and subscribe to the channel. Leave some comments below if this was useful and let me know what situations you've run into with pointers and, or perhaps useful analogies that helped you understand them. And maybe I can summarize those in the future and help everybody out. So thank you for your time and we'll see you again soon.